Muslim. The fact that the boy is Jewish and the man is Muslim would be an irrelevant thing to the Finn. It, the Finn is not concerned with that problem at all in itself, the story. It, if the Jews and the, if the Israelis and the, and the Palestinians had made peace already, it would be totally irrelevant, the whole thing. But where it's relevant, it's because there is all that conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, because uh, other conflicts between Islam now and the rest of the world. We're going towards a very dangerous people because we're cruising ahead towards a real war of, the, of, of cultures and civilizations and religion. And the, the, the powerful Western countries always being on the, on the side of Israel against the Palestinians. I'm not saying that the, the, you should, first of all, before they can solve the Palestinian and the Jewish problem, you have to get rid of it. both Sharon and Arafat must go. These are two incompatible people. They've hated each other for ages. They're not going to start loving each other now. They're not going to make deals together, that's for sure. But do you believe that with, with, with America bankrolling effectively Israel and yeah. with the Arab world effectively backing the Palestinians, is there a real way out of this? Right now, there isn't. I don't have any optimism about this, nor in my lifetime, nor in my son's lifetime. I'm hoping that in my grandchildren's lifetime, there will be peace. You've looked very closely over your life at the Middle East and politics. Why do you think the region is so riven with conflict? Well, because I don't understand that the West doesn't understand up till now Islam. I don't understand that countries which are advanced, like the United States, France, whatever, who have people who have been to greatest universities, to have been to Oxford and who learn about Islamism and all that, have not yet understood that the Arabs are tribal people. There will never be democracy in Arab countries. There will not be democracy. And that is not something bad. Democracy is not the, the panacea of, the, of all the best things in the world. It depends. If people have some education to, to be able to govern themselves, to have knowledge. The, the whole thing starts, uh, uh, democracy starts with education. You cannot be democratic when you are ignorant and illiterate. But are you saying that's because the level of education in the Middle East is, is not generally yet up to that of level where people not. are and they ready are for true. democracy? They are, they are not ready they are because they have not the education and they have deep-rooted tribal sense, a deep-rooted tribal sense. I Iraq is for, you have so many sects in Iraq even the Shiites are divided into the followers of Beni Sadr, the followers of the three, there are three or four big Imams who are Shiites and who disagree with each other. The Sunnis have differences between each other. Then you have all the Kurds and the Kurds fight each other. You have two leaders, Kurdish leaders. They are tribes too. So how do you want to come and say we are going to make democracy in this country? What presumptuous, stupid idea, who ever had this idea? That was not the idea of the world. The idea of the world was to make a war, and they chose the easiest place that they could beat. They, why didn't they go and fight Korea or, or Iran, which is a much more dangerous place? And the most dangerous place of all is Pakistan, because Pakistan, one day, it has already the nuclear arsenal. At least half the army are Islamists. And they will overthrow Musharraf one day. And they will then have the atomic bomb at their disposal. And then they will use it. And they will, the first thing they will do is they will give some to Bin Laden. Because these tribal people are friends of Bin Laden in the certain part of Pakistan where Bin Laden is hiding. You'll never find him there. In tribal areas, yeah. Tribal areas. In terms of France and, and the message about Jews and Muslims from the movie, there does seem to be an increase at the moment in these anti-Semitic attacks in France. There's the debate over whether to ban by law the Muslim headscarf. What's happening in France? I think it's rather charged. What will happen is that there will be a birth of many Islamic schools in France. You will not be able to stop that because they will get money from rich countries when they will hear about this, that the French threw them out of, threw all the girls out of the schools because they're wearing a headscarf, they're going to make private Muslim schools for Muslims. And then it becomes a problem. It will become a much worse problem because now there will be, it will be, they will be divided. There will be no chance of integration anymore. Born a Catholic, converted to Islam at one point. I mean, what are your beliefs now? I have none that I can prove. I, I, 
I believe in everything and in nothing. I don't disbelieve in anything. I mean, everything is possible. As far as my brain tells me, I don't believe, because I believe that God is justice. The first thing that I was taught at catechism, catechism was that God is justice. And I don't see justice in the world. I see terrible injustice. I saw my mother when on her deathbed, she just died four years ago, she's a great believer, and I sat next to her 15 days while well, she suffered terribly before she died, and I saw what relief she got from believing, from calling the Virgin Mary, from calling Jesus Christ to her help, from call, calling Saint Anthony of Padova, who was her saint, favorite saint. It relieved her pain, and I used to think, what shall I say? on my deathbed. Who shall I call for help? And I decided that I would call my mother for help. That's what I'd say. I'd say, Mother, come and get me, wherever you are. <laughs> the great passions, the big passions of your life, uh, the gambling. I never had a passion, nor for gambling, nor for anything else. Horses a little bit, and that was the only passion, and my work. What was it, I guess, that attracted you to the gambling? Boredom. I, I was a lonely man living in, out of suitcases in hotels. And when you arrive in a new place and you don't know anyone, the only place where you can go, uh, if you're a well-known person, to have dinner alone is a casino. You go to a casino, you have dinner by yourself, no one criticizes you, and then you play a little bit to give yourself some emotion, to, to, to fight the boredom of being by yourself, get some excitement, that's all. Have you found yourself lonely? I mean, you've been separated for, what, 40 years now? And you've lived in the hotel and the, the children? 35 years. 35 years? <laughs> yes, uh, sometimes I'm lonely and sometimes I'm not. If I was profoundly lonely, if, if it bothered me, loneliness, I wouldn't be lonely. I could have a girl, I could have a woman with me. I could have a companion if I wanted. I wouldn't want someone to come and interfere with my my relationship with my friends and my, my which wine she wants as opposed to which one I want. I'm happy. You're now almost 72. What is important to you now in life? My family. I have not given, I think, enough time to my family because I was working a lot and traveling. I never worked out of a base. So my family is now my priority. To spend as much time as possible with them and if a good part comes along, to give it all my attention. <laughs>